Hey there, everyone. It's Tuesday. It's three o'clock. That's that means it's Tech Tuesday. Today's topic. I'm going to be talking about an announcement from yesterday or yesterday. Yeah, from IBM Computer that is a significant uh, advancement in quantum computing. Be right back. Thanks for joining me. Rick Husey here with Tech Tuesday today. So uh, this happened yesterday. IBM has announced that they have made uh, some advancements in quantum computing. So I wanted to look at their press release, uh, also show a video of their new uh, quantum computer, quantum computer uh, version two, so to speak. Um, so what is quantum computing? How is it different from what they're now calling classical computing? Classical computing, you've got, uh, ever since we had transistors, basically, You've got transistors which can be in a state of on or off, right? So that's that's basically it. So you've got bits and uh, you know something. The switch is either on or off, and you need lots of transistors. The more transistors you have, then the more uh, computing operations you can do. But uh, you're limited. Uh, we started with you know physical transistors that were you know little components on a circuit board, and then those were all squeezed down into a chip. Where we have uh, you know in silicon, we've got kind of transistors etched in the chip where it can be on and off. And we can have millions of transistors on chips. So that's why computers are so powerful today compared to what we had you know, back in the 60s and 70s, for example, when a computer filled a room, or at least in the 60s, 50s and 60s. Um, but with quantum computing, it's, they use basically this, uh, these two uh, things in quantum mechanics. Uh, one would be uh, superposition, where if you've got a, uh, something like an electron or something like that, it can it can be in multiple states at the same time, and you don't know what that state is until you measure it. Measure it. So it would be like if you're flipping a coin, um, you know the coin's going to land. And it's going to be either heads or tails. So that's kind of like the transistor thing, where when you flip it, it lands. It's either on or off, or it's heads or tails. With quantum computing, it's like when you flip that coin and it's spinning in the air, it could be in one of a number of different states. It could be heads, tails. It could be anywhere in between, really. Uh, that's really what is going on with quantum computing. So you've got that. Kind of that superposition idea, and then there's something called quantum entanglement. And in uh, quantum computing, it's a kind of analogous, analogous to what they call coherence, where you've got two particles, um, could be two photons, could be two electrons, whatever, and they are they can be separated and they can be in the same state. They're both in superposition, and again, you don't know what where they are. It's like flipping two coins and having two co coins in the air. And you don't know where either of those coins are going to be when you observe them. Let's say when you go pick it out of the air, what it's going to be. And with um, ent entanglement or coherence, basically, in the quantum computing world, when you check one coin, the other coin is in exactly the opposite state, I believe it is, if I remember. So I don't know if it's exactly the same state. I think it might be the opposite. Uh, but in any event, when you, when you check one, the other one, you know what the other one is. That's really kind of interesting. And they can be separated, and not just by a few feet when you're flipping a coin, but it really literally could be light years away. You could have these two particles that are light years away, and you don't know what they are. But if they are connected through, um, through this process, through coherence or through entanglement, quantum entanglement, then when you observe one particle, you know exactly what the other particle is. Uh, so that is kind of the key. There's those two aspects that make quantum computing so powerful. And... Um, you know, that's really where uh, the power is in this as far as taking it well beyond what we can do with, with computers today. So I was going to take a look at this article, show a video of what this, uh, what this looks like. Um, so this is, this is their um, press release. So I linked to this. I linked to the video. I linked to another video of um, the IBM, um, basically the conference where they talked about this. So you've got, you can watch everything that they talk about as they explain these new advancements. So I see here IBM debuts next generation quantum processor in IBM Quantum System 2, extends roadmap uh, advance, to advance the era of quantum utility. Uh, and they use the word utility. So what they're saying now is that, I guess the, what they're saying is the big advancement here is that they feel that they have now taken quantum computing to, uh, the, to a utility step where it can actually be used to supersede what you could do with a classical, what they call brute force computing with classical computers. Again, the classical computer with the transistors versus what you're doing with quantum computing. So you see here, um, IBM Quantum Heron, that's the, the one of the chips that they introduced is released as IBM's most performant quantum processor in the world with newly built architecture offering up to five-fold improvement and error reduction over IBM 
Quantum Eagle. Quantum Eagle, I think, came out a couple of years ago. So they're saying now the error reduction is five times that. And that's very important because that's one of the things as, you're, as you've got these um, entangled particles, whatever they happen to be, is that they're very easy to untangle or very easy to go from coherence to decoherence. And you have to have them entangled in order to be able to um, use multiple multiples of these, what they call qubits. So that's another thing is in standard computing, you've got bits. In quantum computing, you've got qubits, and those would be these, um, these particles, basically, that you're manipulating. And it's very hard to keep these things entangled, and it, they don't stay entangled for very long. So you've got to be able to do lots of processes very quickly. I mean, we're talking like less than a millisecond, I believe, now is what they can do with these things, but they still can do a lot in that time. But any kind of vibration uh, can affect that. And the other thing is with these computers, they're really big because they have to be super cooled because you want superconductivity to be able to, you know, you've got to get your temperature down as close to absolute zero as possible. So they're operating these things at like, you know, the environments within the computer at minus 460 degrees, which they will tell you as, is as cold or colder than anywhere in the universe, basically, that they have in these computers. So that's kind of the operating environment. This can have, can have no vibrations, anything like that. You don't want any kind of... Um, it, anything that can come in there that could interfere and knock these particles out of coherence. So very, very hard to do. Um, but this error rate, that's one of the things with the errors that they need to reduce that. Um, for example, um, I think what they have now is like one error per 100 operations, uh, operation steps, and that's not nearly good enough. They need to get up to more like uh, one per 1 million operation steps on these error rates. But they're getting closer now, so I think what they're saying here is maybe they've uh, gotten this quite a bit more with this Heron processor. Um, let's see, uh, IBM Quantum System 2, that's their, that's their new system computer. It's a modular computer system that would be using these Heron processors. That's designed to bring quantum-centric supercomputing to reality. Expansion of IBM Quantum Development Roadmap for the next 10 years prioritizes improvements in gate operations to scale with quality towards advanced error-corrected systems. They actually, in addition to Heron, they introduced another chip called Condor. The Heron one uh, has up to 133, I think, it's in here somewhere, 133 qubits that it can use. So again, you've got these qubits, and then you can have them kind of tied together. And then you, the more qubits you have, the more powerful your computing capacity is. And Heron, I think, is 133, and they've, they've got this Condor one that's up to 1,000. So they've proven that they can scale this thing, but um, what they want to do now is focus on Heron on the fewer number of qubits and really try to get the error rate down and make this more of a reality. So they pr what they did was with Heron, they, or with Condor, they proved they can scale it higher. And with Heron, they're proving that they can get it more reliable. And um, talking about kind of the power, again, if you've got a classical computer and you've got one transistor, so one transistor, again, on or off, and you want to improve your power, and let's say you have 20 transistors and you've got your power 20 times more powerful. If you go from one transistor to 20, you've basically got 20 times the power. Well, with a quantum computer, if you've got uh, 20 qubits, or one, if you've got one qubit, um, and then you double, if you go to 20 qubits, that basically increases like a million times in power. So as you, it's, it's really kind of exponential. As you add these qubits, you're getting a lot more power as you do that. Uh, <clears throat> expansion of IBM Quantum Development Roadmap for the next 10 years. Talked about that. Okay. Q, uh, QSKIT 1.0 is announced. QSKIT is a, um, and I believe it's IBM's, it's an open source software development kit for quantum computers, basically. So IBM's very, they're very transparent in this. I mean, they, they put their quantum computer in the cloud so people can use it. Um, they have this open source, uh, believe it again, it's theirs, the open source operating system that people can use for quantum computers. So they're trying to make it so that just like you could sit down at a keyboard and type stuff in and access a quantum computer in the cloud and, and use that. Now, we would not need to do that generally for the kinds of things we do. A classical computer that you've got on your desk, your laptop is going to do pretty much everything you want if you're a normal person. If you're, if you're a scientist or uh, data, trying to do something really specific uh, with data, if you're trying to figure out how proteins fold and how changes in folding proteins can impact disease and those kinds of things, you need a quantum computer to do something like that. So that's where you could, using your keyboard, access a quantum computer and start to solve problems like that as these computers get better. So they've announced this QSKIT 
1.0 says the world's most widely used open source quantum programming software with new features to help computational scientists execute quantum circuits with ease and speed. So they're trying to make it easy to do. IBM showcases generative AI models engineered to automate quantum code development with Watson X and optimize quantum circuits. I'm assuming that's the Watson, you know, and I got I guess maybe a later version of Watson, the computer that played Jeopardy and beat all the Jeopardy champions. And now I believe the Weather Channel uses that to do some of their forecasts. So uh, that's that really smart computer and AI generative models. So what we're talking about here is not only is quantum computers going to be a tremendous impact to the world and, and the way we live, but you've got AI now that's going to help them become uh, a reality more quickly. So they're using these models to, again, automate quantum code development. Um, this is a picture of the computer right there. And there's actually a video uh, in here as well, which I'll show. Um, so again, this is just the start right here of the, the press release. So again, today at the IBM Quantum Summit, and again, there's I think this is probably linked to that video. I linked it to it in the description as well, where they have the full summit, or I should say not the full summit, but the uh, where they talk about this particular um, development here. Um, they de debuted IBM Quantum Heron, the first in a new series of utility scale quantum processors with an architecture engineered over the past four years deliver IBM's highest performance metrics and lowest error rates of any IBM quantum processor to date. And again, the utility part means you can act now actually start to use it. It's now to a point where if you're looking at a classical computer system and trying to do some brute force simulations and uh, this quantum computer using this Heron, then uh, you've now actually got some things that you can actually do with Heron that you couldn't necessarily do with this uh, classical computing system. Um, IBM also unveiled Quantum IBM Quantum System 2, again, that's the, the new modular system, new modular quantum computer and cornerstone of IBM's quantum-centric supercomputing architecture. The first IBM Quantum System 2, located in New Yorktown, Heights, New York, has begun operations with three IBM Heron proce processors and supporting control electronics. And you see there the processor. And they look like computer processors. Um, in fact, this one, you know, you might see this in your computer, but it's more like a postage stamp. Well, these are more like a little bit, I guess, maybe smaller than an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, not quite 11, I guess, on one side. That's what it looked like when they were showing it. And it has circuitry in it. Um, and what they're doing, which is really different when, than what some of these others, I think like maybe Google and some others are doing, is they are actually using um, metal and a substrate like you would on a particular chip because IBM, they're, you know, they make semiconductors. That's what they've been doing their whole time, basically making computers. So um, they're doing things in a very similar way than you would with a traditional computer. Uh, so uh, unlike, uh, again, some of these, what they're doing is they're actually manipulating the actual particles. So they'll have these uh, photon kinds of uh, tweezers where they can squeeze something and manipulate it and do these things. And they're using something much more similar to what you might find in a standard computer. And they're having pretty good success with it. So. Um, with this critical foundation now in place, along with other breakthroughs in quantum hardware theory and software, the company is extending its IBM quantum development roadmap to 2033 with new targets to significantly advance the quality of gate operations. Doing so would increase the size of quantum circuits able to run and help to realize the full potential of quantum computing at scale. So what they're saying is by, they've extended out to 2033, so 10 years from now, and what they're saying by then is there will be a functional quantum computer that can do a million gate operations uh, versus what we have today. Uh, we're firmly in the era in which quantum computers are being used as a tool to explore new frontiers of science. That's kind of the utility thing they're talking about, uh, said Daryl Gill, IBM, IBM Senior Vice President and Director of Research. As we continue to advance how quantum systems can scale and deliver value through modular architectures, we will further increase the quality of a utility scale quantum technology stack and put it in the hands of our users and partners who will publish or who push the boundaries of more complex problems. They're actually seeking out people, you know, they're, they're seeking out problems. They, they've got this technology they're working on. And again, it only, it's only going to be useful um, in certain situations where we, we can't do it with a traditional computer. So, you know, what I mentioned, uh, you know, modeling proteins, but there's other things, you know, what some just really things that we've not been able to figure out that, frankly, they have said you will never be able to figure out, no matter how big computers get, no matter how much time you have, you will not be able to solve some problems with a traditional computer. 
traditional computer system. However, with uh, quantum computing, you can figure those things out because it's a, it's a different paradigm of how you do computing. As demonstrated by IBM earlier this year, on a 127-bit or qubit IBM Quantum Eagle processor, IBM Quantum Systems can now serve as a scientific tool to explore utility scale classes of problems in chemistry, physics, and materials beyond brute force, classical simulation of quantum mechanics. So again, uh, what that means is taking a traditional computer and simulating quantum mechanics, what happens within quantum mechanics instead of using a quantum computer. And they're now at that point where it makes more sense to use quantum computers. Since that demonstration, leading researchers, scientists, and engineers from organiza organizations including the U.S. Department of Energy's Ar Argonne National Laboratory, University of Tokyo, the University of Washington, the University of Cologne, Harvard University, you can see all these here, uh, they've, ex they've expanded demonstrations of utility-scale quantum computing to confirm its value in exploring uncharted computational territory. This includes experiments already running on the new IBM Quantum Heron 133 qubit processor, which IBM is making available for users today via the cloud. IBM Heron is the first IBM's new class in IBM's new class of performant processors with significantly improved error rates, offering five times improvement over the previous best records set by IBM, by IBM Eagle. Additional IBM Heron processors will join IBM's industry-leading utility-scale fleet of systems over the course of the next year. And again, there's a video here. Um, so I'll go ahead and play that real quick so you can get, kind of get a look at this thing. Uh, I think it's this. Where did I put that? Oh, right here. Here we go. Introducing the IBM Quantum System 2, the world's first modular utility scale quantum computer system. Quantum System 2 was designed to tackle complex problems that lie far beyond the reach of today's classical supercomputers. It stands 15 feet tall and operates in a near-perfect vacuum at temperatures colder than deep space. Initially powered by three 133 qubit heron processors, Quantum System 2 is fully upgradable to the growing line of utility-scale QPUs that IBM will be releasing over the next five years. This is the world's first modular utility-scale quantum system. So in addition to talking about physical qubits, we now need to be concerned with circuit size. By the end of 2024, each of the three Heron processors in Quantum System 2 will be able to process a remarkable 5,000 operations in a single quantum circuit. But the real triumph of Quantum System 2 is its modular design. Our new quantum coupling technology will allow multiple quantum system 2s to connect together to create systems capable of running 100 million operations in a single quantum circuit. Continuing down this path, we plan to realize a system capable of running 1 billion operations in a single quantum circuit by 2033. That's why we call quantum system 2 the building block of quantum-centric supercomputing. Today, our clients and partners are already using our 100 plus qubit systems to advance science, surpassing brute force methods deployed on the world's most powerful classical supercomputers. And soon, they expect quantum applications offering unprecedented business value. Our mission is to bring useful quantum computing to the world, and it starts with Quantum System 2. So that's pretty cool. As you can see there, again, it's big. I expect these things to get smaller, just like we've seen, you remember this original computers that took up rooms uh, that IBM, one of, the, one of the first manufacturers of that as well, these huge supercomputers. And you know now everybody's got probably more power on their smartphone than some of those. So I expect that to happen. But again, you've got the, you've got the unique challenge of uh, keeping these things stable, uh, vibration free and cold so i don't know how much smaller they can get but they've made great strides and it's really interesting because um you know that's been a that's really been an important part of the development of these computers is the cryogenics in order to keep these things cold you know now they've got uh technologies now where you can keep them cold you need you need electricity to do that you don't need to keep rolling in these uh uh like freon or whatever it is that they were using to keep them cold uh so uh, that has improved, and now they can have these things actually shrunk down quite a bit, depending on how many qubits there are. 
Um, but again, I expect them to get smaller, uh, but there's still you've still got that problem. So I don't think we'll be carrying around a quantum computer in our pocket anytime soon, or if ever, we'll have to see. Um, IBM Quantum System 2, it's got that video there. Um, it's the foundation of IBM's next-gen quantum computing system architecture. And you saw the modular part of that, so that's really important. Um, just like anything, with uh, as you add more of these quantum computers together and get them kind of chained together, then you're going to be increasing the the power of those. You just have to be able to work out the bugs to be able to get them all work together. So um, that's really important. Uh, it talks about their uh, roadmap in here and uh, very small in here. I'll bring, I'll kind of zoom in on this a second in a second, but you can see um, down here you've got somewhere. Where is it? Uh, you've got oh Condor. And Heron, these are now checked off. So this is Condor and Heron. So this is where we are. This is 2023 and this is 2024. And this is the roadmap up here that they've extended out to 2033. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit there. So now if you look down in the bottom right corner, you see Blue Jay. That's, that's where they're aiming for. Um, then you see Starling to the left of that. Starling 100 million gate operations uh, for 2029. And you see there also, you see Flamingo to the left of that. Well, Flamingo and everything to the left of that's got error mitigation. That's where you've got errors and you're trying, you've got processes in there to mitigate the errors. But they're saying that by 2029 with Starling, they want to have 100 million of these gate operations with error correction, meaning you're correcting these errors, kind of like the error correction that we have today in communication where, um, you know, you transmit something and it goes from point A to point B. And if there are errors, it gets corrected along the way. Uh, as opposed to an error causing a drop packet, you know, have so many errors that packets start to drop, for example, in communications. They're talking about actual error correction here, starting with Starling in 2029. And then again, Blue Jay, uh, 1 billion gate operations with error correction. Um, and you see it says beyond 2033, quantum centric supercomputers will include hundreds or thousands of logical qubits, unlocking the full power of quantum computing. So um, that's going to be quite significant as we as we get to that point and really this is we've got there's there are i think there are six or so organizations uh working on this you've got um ibm you've got um google i think i'm not sure if microsoft hp i think there's a couple others that are working on it you've got china uh is working on this they've made this a definite priority so whoever does this is going to be able to basically own computing for a period of time, and and it's kind of scary. Yeah, I'm happy that we've got folks that are doing this. IBM's very again being very transparent about it. Uh, if you watch their if you watch their conference there, I mean they're they're describing how they're doing everything, and uh, so they're and they've got this open architecture, or excuse me, open uh, open uh, code that they've got. They're a software development kit. So, um, but this really is going to be this is like the change from no transistors to transistors. Uh, it's actually more significant that, than that. So again, it talks about the QS kit here uh, and that, and that's also talked about um, in that uh, conference. They, they go through the, the uh, Heron processor. They go through the uh, Quantum 2 version of the, the computer and that. So you can check that out. Uh, so again, I link to this. Um, which you can read. Again, you can watch that video that I just uh, showed right here as well if you're on that page. And uh, again, there's a link to the conference. It's, yeah, this is probably right here is actually what that is. Um, that's just an article, but I'm sure there's a link to the conference in there. So uh, this is, uh, again, really interesting, really exciting, kind of scary as well, just how, um, you know, how significantly this is going to be able to change things. Um, and when, anytime you have um, technology like this, that's significant like this, there's obviously really potentially great upsides, but there could be potentially awful downsides to something like this. We talk about that with AI as well, artificial intelligence. Um, it sounds great. There's a lot we can do. You know, you'll be able to um, get answers very quickly. Uh, it'll be able to write code and do all kinds of things, but there's also downsides. And how it could potentially be harmful, you know, and the real concern is, I mean, we put together uh, quantum computing and AI, and do we have a uh, Terminator level event at some point? Hopefully not. So again, it's excited, a little bit scary, exciting, a little bit scary. And um, hopefully uh, everyone that's working on this will uh, do the right thing, and this will be beneficial for us. One thing that we 
have to be concerned about is encryption because you know your credit cards and data that you're transmitting back and forth, all that stuff's encrypted. It's very strong encryption. It would take super supercomputers, you know, if you have a good password, if you have a bad password, if you have a if you have an okay password, it can be cracked pretty quickly by super by even just regular computers today. Um, they can brute force that, especially if you're using known words or have only got like six or eight characters uh, in your password. Those can be hacked pretty quickly. Um, now, whether you're a target or not, it's another question. But um, that's something that is a concern because uh, even with really strong encryption, quantum computers, that's something that you could apply and crack that stuff very quickly. So one of the things that they need to do is use the uh, technology that we have today to be able to come with come up with something that is safe from a quantum computer kind of cracking. And actually, they say they've got that now. And NIST, uh, the National Institute for Security, Tech, something like that, NIST, anyway, same people that are doing the uh, cybersecurity framework, they, uh, I believe next year, are coming out with some new encryption requirements that would help it, help them encryption be safe from, let's say, breaking through a, from a quantum computer. So that's something we need to worry about. The other thing, though, is that with quantum computing, and really more precisely, I would say quantum networking, which is another thing that's being worked on, quantum networks, um, they are actually inherently very secure because you've got that, uh, again, that quantum entanglement that can be used to tell if somebody has viewed something. So again, if you've got these two um, entangled particles, or photons, or whatever it is, electrons, whatever you're transmitting, let's say it's two electrons, and they're entangled, and that's how you're transmitting information. If they're entangled and somebody observes one of them, then it breaks the entanglement. And once the entanglement is broken, then you know that somebody has looked at it. So that is something that uh, with um, quantum computing and quantum uh, networking that actually you've got some built-in um, capabilities there to see if it has been tampered with. So it's pretty interesting how that works as well. Thanks for joining me today. Hopefully this was interesting. And uh, I would suggest if, it, if you were interested in this, go ahead and watch that uh, full video on the, uh, on what the, on, from IBM on the conference when they explain that, because there's lots of slides that they go through. They talk about it more in depth, and I found it uh, pretty interesting. And if you did find this interesting, go ahead and give me a like on the video. I'd appreciate that. And if you're not subscribed to our channel, go ahead and click the subscribe button, ring the bell, and you'll be notified when I'm live. Thanks a lot. And I will see you uh, tomorrow for broadband deployment news. Take care. Bye-bye.